we can just start off by introducing ourselves. Yeah. Uh, okay. You can start with introduction. So I, I will ask, um, just because we had fun with this on the email coordination thread. Uh, so if you could just tell people who you are, um, sort of what you work on, and what piece of science fiction got you into the policy space. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kevin Bankston. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Don't hold it against me. I run a tech policy and advocacy shop in Washington, D.C. called the Open Technology Institute. Uh, I worked for a very long time at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, like this gentleman. Uh, and actually, sci-fi very directly led to me working there. Uh, I was big into cyberpunk back in the day. Uh, William Gibson, Bruce Sterling, Neil Stevenson, that jazz. And, but it was actually a piece of nonfiction by Bruce Sterling called The Hacker Crackdown which was all about the growth of the hacker subculture and the government's response to it. And uh, amongst other things, the foundation of EFF to defend the hacker community against overreaching prosecutions that inspired me to go in the direction I went in with my career. Perfect. Uh, my name is Dave Moss. I am an investigative researcher at the Electronic Frontier Foundation where I work on uh, police surveillance, police accountability, free speech issues. I file a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, I also recently edited a uh, science fiction collection for EFF that's available uh, for creative under Creative Commons for download. And uh, I brought posters of it for anybody who wants it. And uh, I would appreciate if you took them because they were very heavy and I would like to not take them back. Um, as far as uh, uh, some science fiction, I think that uh, Transmetropolitan had a huge, huge impact on me, and I think Scott should cosplay as Spider Jerusalem next year. I agree. <laughs> I am Scott Sigler. I am a science fiction author. Um, been involved with EF EFF for a little while, primarily as a contributor and a signal repeater for the most part. Uh, it's Cory Doctorow's work in it is what got me I guess what got me involved. So I don't know that I really have a stance in the policy space, but I try and discuss a lot of a lot of issues in my work and try and make people aware of certain concepts. Uh, my name is Meredith Rose. Uh, I'm one of the few people up here not affiliated with EFF. Uh, I work a group called Public Knowledge, which is an another policy shop in DC. We do consumer rights and consumer advocacy and uh, copyright and telecom and sort of the digital space. Um, I am also a lawyer. So, sorry, there's a lot of us here. Um, the thing that got me into policy in the first place was probably a combination of within within a year and a half, The Matrix came out, and I'm going to date myself here and say I was 13 when that movie came out. Um, you can judge me for being too old or too young. You go either way. Um, and within a few months of that, I saw um, an anime called Serial Experiments Lane, which is, yeah, I've got at least one fan out there. Um, the premise of which is there's a uh, it's a middle school and there's a girl who dies and then she sends an email to her classmates the day after she dies saying I've only left my body um, and so it's I highly recommend it if you're really into cyberpunk it's really it's gets very philosophical and very weird but that was kind of what turned me on to it. All right, and my name is Mika McKinnon, and I am the which of these is not like the others panelist. Uh, so I am a scientist. I specialize in disasters, and I work in science fiction. So I show up on set, and I teach writers enough science to come up with cool and interesting plots. Uh, as so the sci-fi story that was my origin into the concept of, of d grasping with fiction as a way of addressing policy is a short story co by Spider Robinson called Melancholy Elephants that is about the tragedy of copyright. Uh, and is actually a really interesting story. And because Spider Robinson isn't as well loved on this side of the border as he is in the north, there's probably at least a few people who haven't read it. Please go do. It'll take you like 10 minutes. It's a great read and it's free online. Um, more recently, I will say as a disaster scientist, I was in love with San Andreas as being a way of advocating some policy that I've actually managed to get some decisions made because of that, that will mean real life people will not die in a disaster anymore. Like there's a better chance of life for more people because of that movie. So, yeah. <laughs> so I have a particular fondness for it now. Yeah, so um, it's interesting because the topic of the panel obviously is pretty far reaching. Um, so I don't know if you guys wanted to talk about any particular thing um, or if we just wanted to like sort of talk shortly and open it up to Q and A. Um, so the way I was thinking about this is it is, it is a ridiculously, you know, multifaceted topic. Um, really good sci-fi, 
is, you know, I've always heard it said, sci-fi is about the relationship between man and technology um, and sort of how we let that relationship define our existence with the world. Uh, and so, you know, necessarily really good sci-fi is going to take uh, that relationship to technology and spin it out from where we are now to where we think we're going to be. And you know, we end up with a lot of dystopias because they just make better stories, um, frankly. You can't really write an interesting novel about a utopia. You kind of lose the point. Um, they tend to be hidden dystopias. Yeah. Which is another, like, that's a really fun thing about sci-fi is it allows you to explore these ideas of where the consequences of our current path, where the consequences of if we take this characteristic of our society and continue down this way, where are the ramifications, where are the unexpected outcomes of it, what happens if we amp it up even more. So, like, Brazil is a beautiful dystopia about amping up bureaucracy about what if we just kind of keep going down that path until it's absurd? Or what if we take the author authoritarian surveillance and amp it up even further? Okay, we end up with person of interest. Like we end up with these ways of exploring where are the consequences of the choices we are making now and do we want to go down that path? Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, just to sort of put this out there, um, and I, I do this because I come from a slightly different perspective than a lot of folks up here. Um, I do work in copyright and telecom stuff, um, but part of a lot of my work in copyright has to do with fandom engagement. So I tend to look at fandom and things like fan activities, cosplay, copyright, um, uh, fan fiction, that kind of stuff. Um, and so I come at this primarily from the ability of science fiction and fiction more generally and media more generally to mobilize people about a very specific topic um, and how that sort of cross-pollinates. So I'm happy to talk about that uh, more extensively, but I know everyone else has a slightly slightly different uh, focus than that. So Go for it, Kevin. I got all kinds of things I could talk about. Um, he runs the book club in D.C., by the way. So. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, in talking about the connection between sci-fi and policy, you can actually just look at the composition of, of this uh, uh, panel and at the other panels at the EF track. You know, you have one, two, three, four digital policy organizations that are here, not just because we want to talk about our work, but because we are nerds, you know, and because, you know, our being nerds is part of what drove us in the direction uh, that we took. And in fact, if you go to Washington, D.C., uh, there are a lot of nerds there. They're just not that open about it because they have to wear big boxy suits and, and work on boring things a lot. Um, <laughs> but uh, so when I first moved to D.C. from the Bay Area four years ago, I started a book club for policy professionals who were into sci-fi, so we would read new sci-fi. And not a whole lot of people make it to the physical meeting, but there are over 100 people on the list. And it's not just like non-profiteers like us, it's people on Capitol Hill, it's people at the White House, it's people at the big companies, because they're all nerds who got into tech policy because they're nerds. Um, uh, one person who's not on uh, the list, but who is a sci-fi nerd is Tom Khalil, who's at the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, at the White House. Um, and for example, he just recently, not very recently, did a big workshop where he brought together a bunch of scientists and artists and writers and stuff to talk about how science fiction can inspire our vision of human colonization of the solar system. You know, oh, yeah. there, and, and that's only one example. And I'll, I, I, have, I have a bunch of different examples about um, how right now sci-fi stories are being used as policy tools and, and scenario building tools. But first, I wanted to take a quick quiz. Who thinks, what do you think is the sci-fi text, and I mean that, you know, movie, book, whatever, that is probably the most cited in technology policy, if you had to pick one? Can I guess? Come on, yeah. 1984. Yeah, 1984. It's 1984. It's totally, <laughs> totally 1984. Um, if we did not have Big Brother, we would have, we policy people would have had to make him up to, <laughs> en to encompass this set of ideas around techno technology enabled surveillance state. Uh, it's probably the most valuable, like quick hit concept we have. Um, but a little more trivia, uh, that's the first most cited. The other most cited couple of texts actually come from one man, uh, a gentleman named Walter Parks, who is a screenwriter and film producer. And he's uh, indirectly responsible for a lot of awful things, which is a shame because he's a really nice guy. He co-wrote War Games and Sneakers, uh, and he was a producer on Minority Report, which I would say is probably the second most cited text when it comes to privacy and surveillance policy, both in terms of pre-crime and in terms of targeted advertising and things of that nature, in part because they actually convened a three-day think tank thing where they brought together all the big visionary technologists to help them 
imagine that world of Minority Report. Um, but War Games is a fun story and probably the most direct one to two, you know, A to B story of sci-fi impacting policy because Ronald Reagan watched that movie in 1983 and it freaked his shit out. Um, <laughs> and he and a number of people in Congress got very concerned about the threat of hackers. And in fact, that year, uh, there was an, uh, an opening of a hearing about the threat in the Judiciary Committee in the House uh, opened with a screening of four minutes from War Games. And the ultimate result of that was the 1984 Computer Fraud uh, and Abuse Act, which is our still poorly written, overreaching, chills a lot of good research computer crime bill. So that's, that's just one example of how sci-fi made the world sadly a little worse uh, when it comes to policy. So, in a slightly more cheerful note, is that there's also every year there are numerous science organizations like NASA that convene sci fi authors and say, hey, come here, dream up your ideas, and we'll see if we can make them happen. So, we do also have this we want the dreams, we want the ideas, we want the big hopes, we want you to come up with crazy things and let's figure out if we can build them. There's even an entire set of grants of the, the NASA Advanced Innovative Concepts grants, which are just like flat out science fiction that we're turning into reality of like a submarine exploring the lakes of Europa or undersea of Europa or getting dropped from orbit out of Titan to go explore the lakes. Like those are real things that we're now funding because there were short stories written about them and it sounded awesome and the scientists are like, yeah, yeah, I think we can make that happen. We figure this out. It's an engineering problem now. What's that, pro what's that program called again? The NASA Advanced Innovative Concepts Grants. Uh, uh, to sort of build off of what, what Kevin said, uh, you also see a lot of uh, science fiction creators going to Capitol Hill or going to speak with various federal agencies. David Brin, who uh, as far as film goes, he wrote The Postman, but he's also written a whole lot of books. He's frequently talking to military agencies. Um, I don't know if you guys saw uh, Ronald D. Moore when he spoke to Congress. George Lucas has also <laughs> spoken to Congress. So that's something that comes up a lot as well. Uh, more broadly, I like to think about science fiction as sort of a, a vaccine for the social intellect, that by seeing and imagining all these scenarios that it helps ensure us against some of these things actually becoming reality, at least in a negative capacity. Yeah, like we started talking about modifying people way back in Brave New World, way before we ever had the science to deal with it. So we've been thinking about the ethics of modifying people. We did Brave New World, we did Gattaca, we did all of these things well before we hit the, the era of CRISPR. So we've had a chance to kind of think about what we want to do before our society actually reaches the point where we need to decide what to do. Which the conversations are still difficult, but they're less awful than they would have been if this was blindsiding us. <laughs> Kill the conversation on that. Well, there, <laughs> well, there's an interesting tension and in, in pull. Like, sci-fi can inspire us through utopian or innovative or aspiring visions. Um, or great ideas from people like Arthur C. Clarke, like, gee, geosynchronous communication satellites or space elevators. Uh, and then there's a sort of dystopian vision, which gives us the guideposts of the things we want to avoid. Um, uh, and speaking generally, I, I found in, in policy discourse, dystopias are the more useful um, uh, as a sort of uh, signposting of where we don't want to go. But at the same time, there's there it has led to this impulse sometimes to demonize technology and i mean we've 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 had this for a long time asimov called it the frankenstein complex in his in his in his robot stories where it was like people were predisposed to distrust these robots in part because we've been fed uh uh you know a steady diet of stories about technological hubris and unintended consequences and i i think sometimes that that note of caution can be really important, but other times it can backfire. There was a really interesting piece in the New York Times a, a few weeks ago from a, a friend of ours, Kate Crawford, who does uh, uh, a variety of uh, research, try, trying to find a good way to uh, describe her, but she, and it was called AI's white guy problem. Because we have this issue where right now in discourse around AI, there's an enormous amount of concern from really powerful people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and whatever about, oh my God, what are we gonna do if the singularity happens? Like, what do we do when the, when the AIs wake up? Um, what do we do to stop Skynet, basically? Um, which is actually preventing them from looking much closer to home at, like, how are we gonna deal with robots 
being discriminatory? <laughs> How are we going to deal with unfair algorithms working on bad data in a way that's going to deprive people of housing or jobs or economic opportunity because of where they live or what color they are? Like sci-fi, you know, kind of amped up the concern around AI so much that we, we're kind of looking a bit too far in the future instead of dealing with what's closer to home. But isn't some of that future very close to being here? You talk about Skynet and military machines and you can just go on YouTube and search for robots now, the big dog and other things like that and things that are close to being weaponized. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, that's a far future concept. It's also technical. It's right around the corner. It's legislation away from, yeah, let's put some machine guns on this thing and send it out to do our fighting for us. So aren't, aren't we right there? It's also? interesting, though, because I think in a lot of cases, we and this sort of speaks to the ability of, of you know, sci-fi to give us hope or to terrify us, is that I think a lot of people tend to conflate what they've read in sci-fi with the state that things are actually yeah, at. Like, we are still years away from having a Gundam, as unfortunate as that is. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think people look at things like Big Dog and they're like, oh my God, and the next thing you know, you're going to put a nuclear missile on it and you'll have a Metal Gear. Except um, for, then you like, you look around, why can't we use the pools at Dragon Con? Because somebody used the pool as like a, a watery jail for their mis malfunctioning robot. Like, <laughs> there's a really easy way to defeat the robot out uprising. Use a hose. <laughs> like, XKCD had an entire thing on this, that the more you know about the robotics, the less scary robotics is. I don't know if I agree with that entirely. <laughs> That's okay. If we agree I, with each other, it's going to be a really boring panel. So we need to pick a fight I've, somewhere, I've and seen, robots is a good enough place to do it. I've seen video of, you know, um, I don't know if it's full-on AI, but testing under tightly controlled situations of military machines that are trained to shoot anything that moves within a particular radius. And I can't get close enough with my hose to take that out. <laughs> so it's like we ha we do have some of this some of this terrifying far future technology. We have some of it right now. It's just I guess due to legislation it's kind of held in check. Well, so I mean I I totally agree with you that we have a pretty pressing uh policy problem and it's made all the worse that it's a rule of well, you know it's a it's a uh laws of war international problem and it's very hard to come up with rules in that context around automated automated weapons weapons that make de kill decisions yep. by themselves right. like mm -hmm. that's there's that's like there, there's that. a there's an ongoing discussion about how that it, whether when how that is acceptable and what what the limits are um i was speaking more of the like what do we do when the ai's wake up uh kind of kind of meme but i i, I think that that is an area that is more pressing uh and where where science fiction can help us and I, i'd also just add i i feel like there's so much gold to mine in sci-fi about what to do about our crazy freaking 21st century lives that are so much weirder than we ever expected. <laughs> but we haven't seen really sustained research attempts to, to mine those veins. I just saw one that, that I thought was neat, which is the University of Glasgow is building a database of the treatment of medical technology in sci-fi to, to find new ideas for medical technology. I would love a university to go and do the research on what sci-fi tells us about AI ethics so we don't have to talk about the three laws and only the three laws whenever we talk about AI because they're certainly not, I mean, they're great. I feel like um, that's but one of my friend's theses and now I'm going to have to check. But I, like, I feel like that's a thesis that I've heard about at a conference. I really so want to read that thesis. I, I will see if I can find it. Like, it's quick Googling on there. Well, but And I think the, the thing that we tend to... Um, I, I don't know if we tend to lose sight of it, but it, it is easy to forget in a lot of these discussions is that like, and this is my English major speaking, like literature is inherently political on some level, um, especially when you're talking about sci-fi and a lot of dystopian futures and you have to make a lot of editorial judgment calls when you're building a world as to how you, how you spin out from today into this projected tomorrow. Um, some authors, you get a lot more, you know, depending on how big of the scale of ethics you want to go, sometimes they get very big, sometimes they get very small. Some authors, like you know, Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451, you can't really get a lot more political than that. It's, you know, political stance we can all basically agree with, but it is a fundamentally very political book. Um, and I think sci-fi has always attracted that particular kind, uh, maybe just to more greater effect or to more attention, I can't really say. Um, but, you know, even if you read, like, Orson Scott Card, you know, and we have a lot of this debate about sort of unmanned aircraft and, and the knowledge about killing is Ender's Game right there. Um, and so I think this is, you know, people... I think we have a tendency to treat a lot of literature <coughs> that we're either consider great literature or are just very fond of as being this sort of received 
wisdom that has come from on high, but you know, people, authors are people and they come with their own perspective. And so you, you're gonna have a lot of conflicting visions of the future that can be very easily cited given the situation. And, and fiction's also very conflict driven. You know, again, if you have the, the utopias don't show up because nobody wants to read that because there's no drama and there's no conflict. I find this very interesting. I'd love to see if a lot of these innovations or projections in medical technology are secondary or tertiary points in a book where there's a larger conflict because there's probably not I'm a sure, book yeah. about right. this particular thing. So I wonder how much of these cool ideas that are positive are just kind of establishing facts or bedrock mm -hmm. for a larger conflict story because the robots are out to kill you well, in science so fiction. <laughs> Well, no, yeah. it's, and it's thus my panel themes resume. I was just on the planet was trying to kill you. So, you know, it's all death, doom, and destruction. I agree. Humans it's are ridiculously fragile and people. squishy. Like, we are so easy to kill. Everything is Australia. If this panel had been named Science Fiction is <laughs> Trying to Kill You, it would have been twice the size. Yeah, there we go. You there guys we would have had to get out of the ballroom. No, so it, it is kind of interesting, actually, sort of spinning off of that, like, what, um, what, and it's, I mean, you can go by era and you can figure out, like, what themes are going to pop up given certain social anxieties at any given moment. Like, one of my good friends in college did a whole thesis on how zombie movies actually reflect the particular social anxieties of the time that they were made. So you have, like, all the way from, like, very early zombie movies have this sort of, this, like, you know, mystical darkest Africa and undertone about, like, voodoo and all this other stuff. And then you get to the 70s and you have, like, the religious rapture and then you have biochemical warfare in the early aughts and it, it's it's interesting um but it, it's kind of almost as interesting to think what do we hand wave over in, in a given era um and actually medical now that i think about it every single thing i have ever seen really with medical systems has been like either you stick someone in a pod like full of bacta and then they're fine in two episodes <laughs> or you have a handheld scanner and we just we figured it out you push a button and like you congratulations you i like, see you've read my books <laughs> <laughs> So that reminds that's, me. that's how I do it. Yeah. <laughs> that and reminds then, me in reality, a, we're oh, dealing with like issues of personalized medicine and privacy and things like that, which are, are getting more into the ethics of genetic engineering, which was a 1980s sort of sci-fi trope. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really make a whole, there weren't a whole lot of movies, but like Gattaca, again, was kind of on that elm, but that was more about the, the bias and the class warfare as opposed to the ethics of the genetic manipulation itself. Mm -hmm. One area we're getting into now in fiction is um, artificially created life forms that are sentient and can think for themselves. And that goes back to Jurassic, well not, they weren't sentient, but Jurassic Park. If you create it, is it alive? The book Jurassic Park, not the movie. If you have created it, does the people who create it own it, even if it eventually be, is able to think and act for itself? Does it have any rights? That's one area that's being explored a lot now that we don't have. There's no way to, to measure that, but at some point we'll make things that can make decisions is that is that thing alive and does it have a right to make decisions does it have a right to be treated with um inalienable rights if it was created mm -hmm. so yeah, parenthood. what's that parenthood, parenthood? yeah no, I, 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 I'm a, um, which movie was that um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wanted to i wanted a, a, a couple of things that came to mind one when you were talking about interfaces for medical devices and sci-fi it reminded me of a book that you should all buy after you've downloaded the free poning the future book poning tomorrow. um poning tomorrow uh which is called make it so um oh is that the leadership book no it's a it, oh it's a start it's a star trek reference but it, it is a study of uh, interface design in science fiction movies and television and how it has uh, impacted and been impacted by actual interface design. So this is another area where Minority Report has been hugely influential, but they have a section on medical devices. They have a section on all these different types of devices. It's a fascinating book. It's really awesome. Um, but the discussion of killing robots and robots that kill, um, two different things, I guess. Um, <laughs> Reminds me of, uh, I have a colleague named Peter Singer who right now is mostly wonking on cybersecurity stuff, but he wrote the book on uh, the use of drones in warfare, Wired for War. And he and a partner uh, have done a couple of projects that I think are emblematic of a trend that I think is really interesting in DC where, I mean, we've had sci-fi writers consulting for the government before and especially the DOD for a long time. Larry Niven, for example, was a huge uh, consultant for, for the military industrial complex. We've seen in the past 15 or so years a lot more so-called design fiction or science fiction prototyping where science fiction writers are paid by corporations to write short stories about like people in the future enjoying their products or you know products that they might build. Um, and this is something that say like authors like Madeline Ashby and Carl Schroeder who are pro also professional futurists do a lot of. But what I've been seeing a lot of in the past year or two uh, is what I would call sci-fi policy prototyping, which is 
science fiction written expressly for the purpose of testing a policy idea, influencing a policymaker, or educating the public about a policy issue. And, and uh, the biggest example is, is one that Peter was, in, Peter was involved in, which is a book called Ghost Fleet, which is about, about a uh, uh, fictional future war between uh, China and the US. It's sort of a like techno cyber future thriller war thing um, that is also heavily footnoted to ex because every piece of technology that he cites to is either real or in development and is something that we're going to see deployed in warfare soon. And now this book is being taught in the US Naval War College. Um, you know, it has become a tool for educating policymakers. Um, he has been working with a gentleman named August Cole at the Atlantic Council, another think tank, where they are doing a big future of war project all around sci-fi. So they commissioned some stories by sci-fi writers about the future of science fiction, including Madeline Ashby. They held a contest where they got a bunch of submissions and then published an anthology of, of all these new ideas about the future of war from science fiction writers. They had a contest commissioning uh, uh, propaganda posters of future war. Um, and that's not just, this is, that's just the biggest example. We've seen uh, another think tank, Data and Society, which does a lot of this algorithmic discrimination stuff. They've commissioned sci-fi stories for their conferences to illustrate issues. Um, some of you, if you've been coming to the Electronic Frontiers tracks, you've seen Amy Stepanovich from Access Now, another one of the groups here. Uh, they did a uh, summit on the encryption debate where they had a contest for people to write future stories about encryption. Um, and, uh, and one, one last example, um, actually two, around reporting using sci-fi that I thought were interesting. Uh, Slate's Future Tense has a new series called Futurography, where uh, they spend a month focusing on some key thing in the future, and one of them was killer robots, or robots that kill. And, um, and they commissioned Paolo Bagagalupi, who's awesome if you haven't read him, uh, to do a short story about a robot that kills someone, and about the question of whether that is murder or like uh, a products liability issue and then they got the top robot lawyer he's not actually a robot he's a lawyer who studies <laughs> robots um ryan kalo to, to then write an analytical piece about the, the current thinking in the law about those issues um and then finally I mean, we just we've recently had a robot kill somebody Indeed, uh, and then and then finally, sort of uh, building on on what Micah's ex expertise is, uh, disasters. Uh, there was a great series of short stories in Motherboard that was a pro projection of what the big earthquake that is going to happen in Oregon is going to cause, um, and so it was like very detailed reporting about the risk of an earthquake in that area and what it would do, but told through fiction. So. And just so, a tiny correction, it's Mika, not Micah. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not a mineral. <laughs> I apologize. But, it's okay. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I just wanted to, one, because all these things are f interesting to read and you should check them out, but also I, I think it's a really interesting trend. And, and with people like, say, Tom Khalil at the White House uh, giving it credibility, I think you're going to see more and more use of science fiction in these areas, which and I, I think I is, will, is freaking groovy. I will jump on the end of that and also... Um, I'm gonna Charles. Plug, yes, I was going to say, I was going to plug Charles Dwan, one of my colleagues, um, who wrote a really interesting story that uh, got run on Boing Boing about... Um, it's called Stop the Music. And so, like, he he's a patent guy, but this particular story was about um, copyright and music. And he wrote it in the form of a court decision where there had been a lawsuit by a songs creator saying that this other song had infringed on it and that there is now a memory erasing technology so someone can hit a button and the entire world forgets the song. Um, and so it kind of extrapolates that out. And, and copyright and like sort of soft IP <laughs> is not a place where you, I mean, a lot of these debates are in things like combat in, in war, in cryptography, in like privacy and civil yeah. liberties type stuff. But it does really, it does like spiral out into a lot of different areas. And this is, again, this comes from a patent guy who's, who's a computer programmer and mostly just fights patent trolls during the day. Um, and, and writes a lot of amicus briefs. Like it sounds them, like his but. plot, he probably read Melancholy Elephants at some period in time and was inspired by it, which is actually fantastically ironic given the given material. The subject matter. <laughs> uh, so, you know, read both of them together and then go like, yes, yes, this is life imitating art right here. Everybody is sad and tragic and copyright is a complex emotional subject in weird ways. Yes. That's a lot of questions out there. Yeah, so it um, looks like we got some. Do we have the the, the chuck box? I don't know what it's 
So while we're trying to figure out where the throwable microphone is, uh, so one of the reasons why science organizations will actually work with content creators is to try and create these situations where we get more research funding. So things like NASA worked with the people who made The Martian, or the USGS worked with the people who made San Andreas, because it serves our interest for there to be popular interest in our science, because then we get money and we get support and we get to go keep doing more science. So if yeah. you're a content creator, you can always be hooked up with a scientist who will help you out by contacting the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. Yeah, I, I would say I... Like, my, they will help you out. My modern day fiction is heavily science-based. I have seven people read first drafts. I consider myself the only peer-reviewed fiction novelist, but I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure there are more. But I have scientists, you know, fan scientists lining up to be like, we would love to read that and make that as scientifically accurate as possible. Nice. Yeah. While and knowing it's still a story and you have to tell a story, yeah. but it screws up a bunch of my plots and really pisses me off yeah. for the most part. Because <laughs> then I have to go back and do more work to try and bring it in line with real science. Yeah, so. and, and the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. military had a huge presence at San Diego Comic-Con this year. I think they had three or four different panels in which they were talking about ways that you can work with them. Yep, CDC and NASA show up here. We have a different theme. Yep. Uh, real, real or quick, robots and diseases. We'll get you the zombies. Book called uh, Rob Year Zero by Rob Reed, and that was about when aliens, as our music no, goes no, out no. into space yeah. and aliens listen to it and then have to pay the copyright like royalty that. fees. That's which right. amounts outside to their jurisdiction, <laughs> definitely. Outside it's a, it's jurisdiction. a really funny yeah, book. So I think we got one. We got first question in the back. Okay. Yes, yes, you do. Can you hear me up there? Yep. Yes, indeed. All right. Um, you were discussing earlier about robots and the possibility of making killer bots and such. You know, whatever mankind makes up, I mean, we have this one little failsafe. It's called a power switch. <laughs> we can turn it off. We can reboot it. And what, I mean, how, how hard would it be to keep have that intact as opposed to rendering these things you, totally, our Mars totally autonomous? <laughs> I, I would point you to the Matrix. I would just point you to the Mars rovers. <laughs> like Mars you don't rover. even need to go to sci-fi. You just need to go to our actual robots in space that don't die. Like <laughs> the Voyager spacecraft is older than most people in this room and is still going. The in, like most people, most. not all people. I'm saying most. There's a difference. And there, like there's a little spacecraft. I'm, I'm blanking out on his name right now. That was a, a solar probe that we thought was gone for 30 years, and we recaptured it. Turned it, like said hi, started listening. It turns out it's been awake this whole time, just doing this thing. And so like, we can't turn those guys off. They're just going to keep going. I mean, into we've got a rover that was supposed to last 90 days and is now over a decade and has run a marathon. And you, you can't you can't just assume it's us versus them. I think it's 1972 movie Colossus. Have yeah. you seen that? Yeah. You got to remember that once we have functioning AIs and they're able to interact and negotiate with people, there are going to be a lot of people that come over to that particular organization and interact with them. And if it's in people's best interest for this AI to keep going, then you get into fairly standard conflicts that we have right now. So it's not just a matter of turning them off if there's a line of people with guns preventing you from getting to them. Or, you know, if they look like adorable kitties, adorable sentient kitties who will cuddle you and destroy everything. We already like them. The real life ones are freaking serial killers and we cuddle them. <laughs> there's someone two in like, Arpa writing down now stuff get a in the sentient back row. One. Two words, <laughs> triple robots. Yeah. <laughs> Satanic Teddy Ruxpin will eat your soul, buddy. <laughs> but will be redundant. adorable and cuddle you <laughs> at the Ruxpin. same time. Me out so much. Yep. Yeah, um, I've heard about the panels um, about AI, but um, I want to kind of take the narrative a little bit further and talk about the possibility of what is the panel think about transhumanism. We're talking about AI, but what about us interfacing with machines? Well, I mean, you see now people with prosthetic limbs and the future of prosthetic limbs. I mean, having brain deficiencies, having chips, and ultimately to possible mind uploading and what is what are you guys opinions about that and the possible legislation legislation on Washington about you know us to what extent are we going to be interfacing with these machines or technology what is I would actually so as a gamer and an anime fan um, I think there are two actually in franchises that have dealt with this exceptionally well which is the Deus Ex games um, and Ghost in the Shell uh, which both really sort of dig down into that idea of, you know, if you accept human nature as, as one of swing and backlash on the pendulum, you know, there's, I think, I, I tend to buy into the Deus Ex model of, of there's, you know, you're, you can expect to see this whole backlash of, 
you're not really human and to what extent does that curtail your individual rights and like I don't know I think that's a genuinely really interesting question I would love to see the FDA um, as the people who would have to get on these cybernetic implants suddenly be tasked with this well I think love that might be the wrong word but it would be interesting <laughs> So what would be interesting about this is I think that it's something that for once would restrict men before it restricted women. And I say this because right now there is a huge portion of women who are actually, by technical definition, cyborgs. Like, if we do gender politics on this, any form of implanted birth control is technically speaking a mechanical or robotic aid, or mechanical aid in all cases are current, no robotics at the moment. That's a whole different panel. Uh, <laughs> So that, th robotic, that was a science track panel after 10 p.m. We're before 10, we're not going there. Um, <laughs> so it's any form of implant that goes beyond normal human limitations. That is the definition that applies to any form of implanted birth control. But we don't call, like, what is it, 30% of women in the U.S.? We don't call them all cyborgs. So I think that's one of those places where the gender politics will be very interesting. The, the guys are going to be restricted way before the women are. Have you ever read uh, Mind Scan by Robert J. Sawyer, sir? That's a great one. That's the concept. Uh, it's, it's uploading, but uploading to a cyborg that looks just like you, and therefore who actually has the rights to the, who has the rights to the property, who owns, who has the money, et cetera. So as people get older and they want to go on living forever, they're able to implant their mind into this perfect cyborg, but the old person is still there and still aging. And it creates it. it you, if that's a question you're looking at, uh, Mind Scan by Robert J. Sawyer is a great book to check out. So here's well, also, Old Man's War is uh, going into that concept as well of, of you get a whole brand new body, but now you're in service. Yeah. Um, and a question that I have in terms of, of I'd love to hear, I'd love to read some more sci fi on this is the concept of uh, ownership of your DNA. That we're currently we're at the state where we can do personal sequencing. We upload it all, and we're doing it all to private companies that have policies that can change at any time and we don't have policy protections in place about discrimination based on your genetic code which makes me nervous yeah. like honestly that genuinely makes me nervous it is actually i will say like so i was a participant in the personal genome project that harvard ran um and it's it's mostly been suspended now due to lack of funding but it is fun because every quarter for the last uh, i don't know eight years um, they'll send an email and you have to take a questionnaire and they will warn you every time you could be discriminated against for what we post online we literally have no idea how like yeah. it could be anything but you you have to take an assumption of risk and it's a risk they can't even really articulate they're like eh, we people will be creative and screw with you about this yeah and then there's a the concept of like can you copyright dna because we've already we have genetically modified seeds that are fully restricted and owned so what happens if like you get your sequence scanned and then somebody copyrights haven't, a chunk of it. Like people tried that. Or, haven't people tried to copyright sequences of human DNA? And it's been they, turned down. They, they've tried to patent. They've tried patent. to patent. That's them, a yeah. patent. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's interesting questions there that I would love to see in fiction before we run face first to it in reality. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of the things that I think are interesting are, I mean, I was thinking about source code as we were sitting here and that a lot of these sort of transhuman and cyborg related things are coming through uh, the Veterans Administration, things that uh, can put, uh, you know, injured warfighters back, you know, either, you know, into the workforce in general, but maybe eventually back into the military once they've lost limbs. What would, here, if you're uploading your consciousness into a data bank, what would that EULA look like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's well, a free idea, by the way, for any authors in the crowd. And it would um, and like uh, what happened? Yeah, no one would read it exactly. <laughs> what we have the equivalent of brain injuries of like, well, you know, every now and then you like you get a concussion and you have enough of them and your personality changes in some ways. Oh well, well, we had a couple flip bits. Sorry about that. It happens. <laughs> You should have worn a helmet. Mm. <laughs> I'll, I'll just throw out on the genetic thing. There's a great short story that's available for free online by Paul McCauley called Gene Wars about a future where there are conflicts over ownership of genetic material. Um, on the not brain uploading but, but modified brains, I recommend Ramez Nam's Nexus trilogy, uh, which is about um, basically a nanotechnological drug that you ingest into your brain that allows you to network with other brains and have telepathy and share skills and, and, and create mass group minds and stuff. And, and I've, I've, I've actually found that to be a, a fun um, thought experiment and, and, and um, metaphor when talking about issues around government hacking. So the people who are in the government hacking panel, I apologize for repeating myself. Um, because it does, you know, when, when our brains are internet enabled, 
And that's not crazy at this point, looking at where the science is going. I think uploading is, is much farther in the future. How would you feel about the government secretly installing malware in your brain? And like, and even if you do think that's crazy, it's a good metaphor for where we are now, because in many ways our phones and our laptops serve as like our offboard brains at this point. Like they, they have our entire lives on them. So how comfortable are you with the government doing that? Anyway. And, and to a certain extent, we... Uh, Nexus? By Ramez Nam, and, and to a certain extent, we are already uploading our brains online. I think I worry about you know 150 years, 200 years from now, when Google is looking at these conversations and emails and IMs and photos and everything that we've we've put through their their cloud, and suddenly there's no privacy interest because we're all long dead. The copyright, if there had ever been any, has won't run out, and suddenly they have just every memory of yours that has passed through the net and what can they do with that what kind of creature can they create that has these memories and everything you've seen i mean i've been running around with the 360 degree camera at dragon con capturing what i saw uh at various points of the night and i'm going to be able to look back at those and somebody else is going to be able to look back at those as if they were one of my memories there was there was enough creepiness in that and like the building of the artificial human to endorse uh a, a product was it Muhammad Ali they made a fake one of for commercials it was okay there we go can you tell I go. don't deal with things that aren't science like human squishy fragile stuff is not my domain like can you kill it with a landslide yes no all right good that's my classification <laughs> next question yeah most of the policy that affects my life is really done at the local level uh, is there actual science fiction that's informing that? Because we do have modern dystopian societies on the local level, if you look at whole neighborhoods in Detroit and what's happened there. So one of the things that I found interesting was this uh, video game Watch Dogs that came out oh, a couple yeah. years ago. And part of the premise of this game is that the city of Chicago has installed, has hired a private contractor to digitize the entire city in terms of connecting all of the uh, infrastructure, connecting people's communications, and once you have that in place, if that company's evil, evil things might happen from that company. If that company's not good at doing a good job of keeping it secure, a few hackers suddenly have access and are able to access CCTV cameras whenever they want, are able to access the facial recognition systems that are going on, um, hacking streetlights. And you know, I, f I think that's a really good example of looking at, at very, very local, because it is a, a, a city. And I think that when Watch Dogs 2 comes out, uh, I think in November when it's dealing with San Francisco, there's going to be even a lot more to that. Mm. So I'm really stoked about it. I cosplayed as Amy Pierce yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I could take in a slightly different direction and look at Charlie Strauss was writing The Holding State and actually had to abandon it because it was a, a, a near future dystopia about Scottish independence. Ooh. And then there were votes on Scottish independence and he was just like, I'm out. Yeah. Done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write something else later, but this trilogy is staying at two books forever. Um, I actually, so this is, it doesn't deal with it directly like as a central theme, but um, Snow Crash has a good amount of those sort of hyper-local uh, like enclaves that are, I think, largely corporate-owned, if my memory serves correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, it's not necessarily like a running, it's not like the central focus of the book, but it is kind of fun when they're like off delivering pizzas, and he has talks about having to get in these different gated communities owned by different corporations, and, and like, like their own... Passports weird, and everything. Right, and he has yeah. to have a passport for everything, so it is that kind of like hyper-local balkanization. That also it, had the one of the best misses ever in books, because he kind of predicts a hyper a hyper reality and mm -hmm. the internet and he does all this amazing stuff that came true and much of the beginning of the book is about people still returning VHS tapes. So that was <laughs> yeah. that was kind of awesome. To be very kind of what I love second about life and that also sort of went. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite things about Snow Crash is that that's the, the one book the universe is trying to get me to give away more copies of in that I will find copies of it like sitting in a gutter that I pick up and then I run into somebody who's never read it that same day and I just pull it out of my purse and hand it to them. And this has happened easily dozens of what, times what's now. What's the joke from um, uh, Good Omens about if you leave a cassette tape in a car for long enough, it becomes the greatest hits of Queen? Yeah, it's, it's apparently for me... If you Which leave me alone long enough, a copy of Snow Crash will, will appear, appear somewhere, nearby, somewhere. And then somebody will walk up and say, gee, I wish I'd read Snow Crash. I've never read it before. And I'll just be like, I'm a transfer mechanism for this book. You should get a commission. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, a lot of different um, ideas have been bouncing around in my head while I've 
been sitting here listening to it, but one theme that it seems to keep coming back to is population control. There were there were a lot of different sci-fi shows in the last like <coughs> 10 years at least that have been talking about it in some way or another. Man of Steel, they talked about population control on Krypton and all the, you know, artificially grown babies and whatnot and Children of Men, you know, about how nobody had any children at all. And then there was uh, another one, Battlestar Galactica, the new series. Logan's when, Run? Yeah, when they were... when. Yeah, when Battlestar Galactica, they were so um, diminished as a race that they made abortion illegal in, like, every single case. I could never really think of a scenario on present-day Earth where population control would actually be enacted, but... I don't know if any of you might have. I mean, well, one child policy. China. Yeah, yeah. Th- it is well, already enacted. I mean, yeah. And that there's, just got repealed, but yeah. there's, there's a lot of places where there's also, if you start looking into um, the, the cultural pressures on it where we end up with entire gender dispar- disparities in countries because there's different genders that are valued in different ways. So, I mean, one of the things I find really interesting is looking at, um, we have not had a whole lot of, really biting gender politics to keep up with reality. Like, we had Ursula K. Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness, which is, like, that one is the reflection of now, so what are what do we need to be writing now to reflect what we're looking at in the future in terms of how do we view gender, how do we decouple gender from physiological biology, and how do we look at that, and how does that impact how we build families and family groups and family structures and social structures? So that's something I would love to see more of. There's actually, so the um, the Expanse series deals with global overpopulation. I love that. I love the Expanse series. I'm so super. Oh, yeah, book. overpopulation. Um, there's some great yeah, stuff. Yeah, so they actually do a really good job about the overpopulation of Earth and sort of the, the um, like, human diaspora out into the solar system. Um, and the overpopulation of Earth, basically, I think it's they said something like like... 12 billion people are now living on the planet in this scenario, and they have this thing called basic, which is basically if you decide not to work, you just get a guaranteed income. It's I mean, it's a crappy existence, but it is it's sort of it, he really takes, Jeff is say Corey like really takes the concept and sort of spins it out into like, he, I mean, he does a lot of really great world building a lot, about a lot of social issues like race and class and gender. Um, the whole series is is really, really well thought out, um, but I always really enjoyed his his depiction of Earth and what it's like. Where how, how could you possibly have like 12 billion people living on this planet? What would you have to do to make that happen? Terrible, terrible things. Yeah. First of all, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to Children of Men, because if you haven't seen it, it's, oh, it's so quite good. possibly one of the best science fiction movies of the past. Uh, decade and and on a sad note like I feel like it very it kind of hit the nail on the head about sort of where Europe is going I mean increasingly depressed increasingly totalitarian uh, refugee camps and and you know all these uh, yeah Mm -hmm. man that that movie hits hits hard Um, but on population control I mean there's the late issue of 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 uh, anthropomorphic not not anthropogenic genetic I can never get that word right human caused climate change anthropogenic um, and and you know uh, for me like one of the one of the things that first turned me on to that as an issue that I should never stop thinking about was Bruce Sterling's heavy weather back like 30 years ago um, but I, I do think we are increasingly entering a phase where if you're a science fiction writer and and your future doesn't directly grapple with climate change like yeah. you're not doing your job because because that is our future. Like we, we, yeah. we are losing cities. You know, there are massive uh, populations that are going to be displaced. It's going to be much hotter. The weather's going to be much worse. Like that is happening. And like, even if you deal with it through some like, oh well, we did this awesome geoengineering thing that somehow didn't backfire and destroy <laughs> us all, like in Snowpiercer. Um, you know, fine. Like do that if you have to. But like at least address it. Yeah, um, give us a, like a MacGuffin to blame it on. Or, um, or you can write Oryx and Crank. So I, I I will say that. So I do a lot of science consulting for a lot of things that may or may not ever see the light of day. And the two most popular topics in the last year and a half are time travel slash parallel universe stuff and climate change. Like, talk to me about near future climate change. So I've got, like, entire folders of reference material on, like, okay, so this city's doing this, and this one's doing this, and this region's doing this, and we're all going to die in creative and interesting ways. 
Uh, so I expect that. that there shall be at least some more themes of that in the future, which is good because when I was writing for io9 and we were trying to come up with a list of like the top 10 most interesting climate change themed movies, it was a very, very tragic list. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a top 10, it was a 10. Um, <laughs> Well, so. I do think th this goes back to your point about your question about local stuff. Uh, because our large governmental institutions are completely dysfunctional and not able to grapple with global problems, you are actually seeing a great deal of climate, like uh, a attempts to m not mitigate climate change, but to adapt to it at the city level. Um, yeah. And I it's think that's where you're going to see a lot of locus of energy in that area. And so I think that cities could maybe learn some from science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Do you the and if you're, you know, a science fiction writer, you can always write s stories featuring your hometown and the terrible things that are going to happen to it, and then present it to the mayor as a gift. Yeah. <laughs> Dear City Council, I have a statement to make. It's about our future. It's I'm pretty New Orleans. Orleans. It's going to be a really bad story. <laughs> flash fiction. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Not, not to rain on the parade too much, but automated weapon systems have been deployed. Uh, the South Korean border, uh, South Korea deployed a fully automated uh, gun platform that just detects people and kills them. Just like the ones in Aliens, the extended director's uh, cut. Uh, but on, on the uh, positive note, uh, so there are um, utopian systems like uh, Star Trek um, and uh, the Culture series by Ian Banks. Um, so Star Trek obviously has a certain amount of policy that have come uh, from that. But can you think of and, and talk about other utopian uh, science fiction where good policy has come from people thinking and talking about it? Happy, happy times. I'm really very doom centric. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's hard for me to do happy, happy times. I mean, I I know, it's, it's, it's really hard to figure that out because when policymakers get it right ahead of time, you don't notice it. You know, if things, if your life continues on at a fairly even keel and your primary concern is, man, I'd really like to get that new job as opposed to mm -hmm. where, when am I ever going to eat again, you're not really paying, you don't notice successful work. So I, I don't know how I would answer that question other than when people get it right, it's invisible. It's a lot like writing or storytelling itself. Good storytelling means you don't think about the storyteller and you're lost in the world. Great future thinking legislation probably means that you never even consider it because it didn't happen. So I would say probably around government transparency. I think that where, you know, when you see things like video conferencing happening in science fiction in the 80s and things like that, I think that we start seeing that uh, when it is embraced by government and we're able to do live streaming of city council meetings, we're able to do live streaming of Congress, uh, people are able to, you know, start, you know, very soon we'll probably see people be able to file public comment by emailing videos in. I think that sort of stuff, uh, the transparency with government can be, you know, reflected pretty well in, in science fiction and maybe has an impact on it. So I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. I found a way to be happy and positive. So, you know, everybody give me a cookie. Um, so one of the ways that we, that science is uh, science fiction is really interesting as it leads to cultural change it changes our images of what people are and one of the ways it's been really lovely in the last chunk of couple of like let's call it a decade and a half is that we're changing the perception of what does a scientist look like it used to be lab coat old white dude big frizzy hair Albert Einstein. If it wasn't him, it wasn't a scientist. Now we have so many other cultural stake points on what does a scientist look like. Everything from Abby Shito in NCIS is punk rock lady with crazy high heels and spiky neck things, and she's a scientist. Or we have uh, an entire cast of Ghostbusters with the world's greatest engineer who is just like all of my physics classmates. Like that just, that, that, them's my people right there if you want to know what I'm like on a night off. Um, so we're, we're changing what it is that we, our perceptions of who scientists can be, which means that we're changing who actually goes into it. And we're changing uh, the policies to go around that of how do we do outreach? How do we communicate with them? How do we, how do we realize who our audience is? And I see it in science because that's my field, but I feel like that's also happening in other areas if we're getting a greater diversity of voices heard, which leads to a greater acceptance of other cultures. So we have like uh, Harry Potter, we had multiple characters in there who were very big on the whole cultural understanding thing. Like we had, yes, the whole advocating for the house elves, but we also had Dumbledore was constantly saying, try and understand the group of what the, the magical creatures are doing. and. Can I, can I give a good shout out to the Harry Potter Alliance if anybody is <laughs> yeah. involved with them for using fantasy to help push public policy change? No, I don't know it. I don't, tell me oh, more about that. Harry Potter Alliance is a nonprofit of 
people who grew up on Harry Potter and who have felt uh, the call towards social change through Harry Potter, and they use that to push for everything for, uh, you know, a fair trade for chocolate that has been distributed by uh, Harry Potter to uh, uh, creating safe spaces for transgendered uh, uh, children on campuses. They take on a whole variety of issues. They've worked on uh, uh, surveillance issues with us for the EFF. They're a great organization. So, so there we go. We have Harry some Potter positive lines. outcomes of policy from Utopias. I don't know if I call Harry Potter a utopia, but you know, I, I, was, I was trying there. Uh, good evening. I wanted to revisit, uh, you guys brought up CRISPR earlier, and I know that's more of an immediate future thing, and I wanted to revisit that. Um, I wanted to know where our government currently stands as far as conversations and its um, policies possibly being formulated around it, uh, just because it is in such an immediate future that I, I figured that someone would have spoken about it. And if they even understand what they are creating or attempting to create policies around. I would say the scientists don't entirely understand what they're doing with it yet. I didn't, um, I didn't, can you around what? CRISPR. CRISPR. Gene editing. I'm sorry? It's gene editing. Uh, okay. the, the question is what policies are in place around if, gene editing? If our government is aware and if they are starting a conversation around it, just because from what I understand, from what I've read recently, it is in a more immediate future uh, as it's being developed and is being developed rather quickly. From what I've um, been reading or keeping up on, it's, uh, you know, people are already attempting to use it in laboratories in other countries for testing and whatnot. Um, I just want to know if you guys had any input on that. So it's not, a, it's not a topic I follow. I will say that it's almost certainly being looked at by some members of Congress. Um, like, you know, we, we rag on Congress a lot and they're really bad at a lot of things, but someone up there is almost always paying attention to something coming up like CRISPR. Like there's gotta be at least one person up there who's listening to it. Um, as far as whether they actually understand what they're talking about, that's a different question. So um, but I would be shocked if no one was talking about it. I just don't know the specifics. Yeah. So this is in the bi biology half of things, so it's very much in the domain of, eh, squishy. <laughs> um, but I know that the CIA is paying a lot of attention to it because potential to, uh, like, at least... This is one of those areas where sci-fi and actual science are so thoroughly conflated that it's it, y pulling them apart is entire panels, again, on the science track and all over the place. Um, but that they're worried about it being able to create WMDs and things like that. And we're not there yet, but it is a plausible sort of thing to worry about. So the CIA is involved in it. Uh, I know that the American Association for the Advancement of Science has science fellows whose job it is is to effectively do science tutoring for congressional staffers. And pretty much all the national science organizations have this. The American Geological Institute. Uh, I did the American Institute of Physics for a few months. I was a science lobbyist. It was super fun. It, scientists in the room. This is a great way to get involved in policy. Um, so I know that they have statements on CRISPR and they're working on the ethics of CRISPR. I would very much hope that they are briefing Congress on it, but I don't know that chunk. Uh, I don't know what briefings are happening, but we're also not at the stage of human trials yet. So there's a lot is happening very quickly, but uh, the reporting on it is also not entirely clear. And we are really mixing up science and fiction very thoroughly as to what's actually happening all at the same time. Just one thing, like with the um, you know, genetics, looking at the Henrietta Lacks story mm -hmm. oh and her family is finally getting agency back for her cells. But genetic information is a protected class. You cannot be discriminated against because of your genetic oh, information. Good. That makes me so much happier. Yeah. Um, oh, it's it's, it's actually protected the same as gender identity, as race, as religion, as anything else. So don't worry too much about your uh, what you're putting out there. I'm on the, the wrong side of the border, so I'm sure our laws in Canada are, are special and different. We have a whole different set of problems. Yeah, I think we're on time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So thanks everyone hey. for coming hey. out. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. So I'm going to jump out this door and be out on that side as you guys file out. I've got posters for you. Uh, and I'm just going to do More some swag. quick. I'm going to do some quick panel plugs, which is the Salt for X Science Show at 10 p.m. is going to include science storytelling and science improv. I'll be getting up there doing PowerPoint karaoke, doing an improv lecture. Uh, so I will be there as well. Yep, that and there's also awesome. going to be Scott. So there you go. Reasons to head up to 10 p.m. in uh, the Grand Salon. Yeah.